have some great questions and some feedback. So also positive feedback is always welcome. Um, this question is from Horacio. Can you see that in the Zoom chat? Well, the vocal fry question. So very interesting question. And Donald Miller, uh, who is another researcher that figured out a lot of this stuff and passed away recently, was a dear friend of mine. Uh, he used vocal fry. And, and that's, that's another, any, any noise that you put into the vocal track, noises have like an infinite number of frequencies. So they will populate the resonances of your vocal track. And then what you hear, you'll hear the peaks, the peaks of those, uh, those sounds that you put in. Vocal fry is another example. But let me, let me just interrupt quickly because not everybody can see this question. So I'm gonna read it. It says, hello, Kenneth. To get to the formants with Voce Vista, is it better to use a whisper than fry vowel, which I've seen other guests use on Singing Revealed? At least with voc vowel fry, I can't always see F1 and F2 clearly in the spectrum. Maybe I'm not doing the vowel fry right. Is it about generating a white noise and filtering with a vocal tract? It is about generating a noise that has a wide enough spectrum of frequencies from low to high. And to be completely honest, why do I use the whisp? Why did I start using the whisper instead of the fry? I had a, uh, a health deterioration problem where my thyroretinoids, the bulk of the vocal folds, started wasting prematurely. Apparently, it's genetic. They never could find a neurological cause for it or even a behavioral cause for it. And that caused my voice, my vocal folds to bow. It is very difficult to do a good vocal fry with bowed vocal folds, which is also why my voice is a little less clarion. It's a little breathier sounding. You know, some days it's a little bit better than others. But uh, so I, I had to use another source. So I started playing around with a whisper. Now, in both cases, vocal fry or whisper, you have to do a good version of it. Mm. A typical whisper is done with a high larynx to highlight the higher frequencies where most vowels are defined. And it's not what I wanted for classical. Typical whispers like this, e -A -A. very mouthy and spread in high larynx. I didn't want to use that one. So I learned, I developed this chiaroscuro whisper, which is a relaxed throat whisper. And it's a more internalized. It's actually the most soothing way to whisper possible. It feels like you're doing nothing. In fact, you can even pretend to be a ventriloquist. Don't move, feel like you're not moving anything almost or not anything you can see. Or here's another silly one. You're in zombie land. Until you get to the O-O-U where it's helped have a little bit of lip rounding. It's like you're hardly moving anything and the noise moves more into the vertical pharyngeal column and away from the front of the mouth. If I do the typical whisper, I will have raised my larynx and narrowed my pharynx. Curiously, if you do the chiaroscuro whisper, you will tend to get these pitches for those vowels. B A G D B A G, and, and now you're not going for pitch there, right? You're just you're just making well, the vowel shape and sending air through. What what is, how how does that work? Oh, that's a very good question because initially I wasn't. I was just trying to find the most comfortable way to whisper the, a good version of those vowels, and those were the pitches that came out when I got to the best chiaroscuro whisper. I assumed that everybody would have their own pitches because the assumption from science is, is that everybody's formant set varies per voice type. This is what I've always thought. It's what everybody's always thought. Surprisingly, I am finding that people, when they do the best set, are targeting the, the identifying frequency of those vowel colors from spectral tone color. And so people are targeting pretty darn close to the same pitches. That is, that is news. And it may not prove to be true across all singers, but so far in the set that I've tested, it's been the case. So, so now to answer your question, now that I've learned that's the case, I've started using the pitch as part of the auditory target to help them find the best way to chiaroscuro whisper. I always 
put this caveat. I say, whatever you do, it's got to feel the best possible way to whisper. It should feel soothing and like you're not doing any pulling down or lowering work in your throat. You just, you can use affects that take you more internal. So it's not so externalized, like try a child fright. Kind of, I want my mommy, help me mommy. Or mischief. Kind of pleased inside. Anything that will pull that, that more internalized, comfortable, and make it less mouthy. That's not the whisper we want. Notice the pitch is cleaner and clearer when I find the right one. Whereas is a little bit more of a less clear pitch. It's more spread. And I'm using very gentle, very gentle glottal clicks. Doing inhalatory clicks will also do it. That's all inhalatory. That it's so fascinating. Look at, I, I don't know if, if I've been doing this at home while you've been talking about it and I'm, I'm targeting the same pitches with, no, I'm not going for the pitch. I mean, maybe something's sinking in, but I'm hearing those intervals more and more. Anybody else um, out there listening, experiencing the same thing? And let me give you this advice. If you open the mouth as you go to the more open vowels, that will pull this, the, the whisper out to your mouth more like this. Leave the mouth very... Don't open. You don't in speech. E -A -A -R, e -A -A -R. You hardly move, right? You're not holding your mouth. You're just leaving it alone. E -A -A -R, yaw, yaw. Instead of yaw. Notice when I do it this way with a whisper, I start hearing more of the complementary color. I hear more of that uh, uh. Yeah. The ah uh is in there, but the uh, uh is in there too. Yeah, we get we have some uh, great questions popping up. So thanks so much for these wonderful questions, um, and thanks for this. this. So they, somebody wants to know the pitches. I see Kim wants to know. Hi, Kim. It's B, uh, <laughs> B, B six A six G six. My keyboard doesn't go up that high. It's these are fives, but think B six A six G six D six for E A A R. -A and then all o u is the b a g an octave lower and the a ah is the d in between i can do a whole scale with different vowels did you hear that they're all vowel you know Vowel identified frequencies to an extent, but you do have to find this very relaxed, soothing way to do yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, I, I actually find that very beneficial as well. Having people say, "Can you speak with a warm whisper?" Just to get them to relax in there. But this is this is uh, it works. It works quite well. Let's. I'm re very curious as well how. Um, but I want to answer a few more questions. We'll come back to it. But uh, also now applying this for a singer, how a singer is going to take this and improve uh, a phrase or their singing in general. I just quick see Kim uh, is F sharp six. So, um, so yeah, let's let's see if uh, first of all, I'll just send a text and see if anybody anybody in our zoom meeting wants to perhaps experiment with this how using this chiaroscuro whisper can improve their singing and while they are thinking about that i'm going to read you a question from dundrum light would you say a little bit more about a topic saus touched on about the link between f2 and the pharyngeal space put the brightness in the back as you mentioned it as an acoustic event or an idea for teaching. And I've also been saying um, to a few uh, uh, clients, do the tuning back there. What can you, 
Can you elaborate on that for Dune Lauren? Great question and fascinating. And, and Wolfgang turned my head upside down about that four or five years ago when I first had a conversation with him. Here's why. Because we universally perceive bright to be forward and dark to be back, everybody, as far as I know, assumed, as I did, that F1, the lower resonance, was pharyngeal and the higher resonance was oral. Like I've got this lower resonator here for F1 and this higher resonator here for F2. So I was having a conversation with Wolfgang and I said, so, you know, I, I realized that actually, and he knows this too, the whole tubing is involved in tuning of all of the resonances because they're, they're sound waves that are being reflected and building up power through the entire resonator. But changing the shape or dimension of parts of the resonator moves them around. But anyway, I was, I was telling Wolfgang, so I sort of feel my my F1, my darker one here, and my brighter one there. And he says, oh, no, it's just the opposite. And I go, what? You know, so anyway, I, I, you know, thank you, Wolfgang. You, you saved my life there. Anyway, I was depressed for two days getting over <laughs> there. Uh, but I finally began to think, because the Italian teachers, the old Italians would say, the vowels are formed in the pharynx. I said, what? They said, the pharynx is the mouth of the voice. Well, most vowels get their identity from the higher formant, the second formant, the second resonance. And they were apparently perceiving that pharyngeally. So I put that together with Wolfgang's comment and I started playing with it. Here, I will just prove it to you because this is the simplest way to do it. I'm going to take an E vowel. There's my E pitch. You, I think you can hear it fine. E, e, e. Now notice, I'm going to open my mouth to modify that E vowel for a high note on an E vowel. Using the caudoscoto whisper, I'm going to model it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to retain the auditory target of that pitch and that E color. That's my second formant. I'm going to ridiculously open my mouth, but try to keep that same auditory target. I'm going to try to keep my neck relaxed. So I'm not going to try to work back there. I'm going to back it up a little bit. Are you still hearing that? I'm going to speak through that shape to show you what the heck that sounds like in speech level. E, e, e. What the heck is that? That's the, the, the correct modification for an E vowel on a high note. That's what that is. And how do I know? I kept, I kept my auditory target of my second formant. Now, if the second formant were being predominantly tuned by my mouth, it should have changed pitch big time because I changed the shape of my mouth big time. But I kept my tongue dorsum, the hump of the tongue, close to the roof of my mouth, and I kept my pharynx approximately the same. That's how I kept that E tuned that way. So according to Wolfgang, and I agree with him now that I understand that, I'm predominantly tuning that second formant with my pharynx. Even though I acknowledge that the, the sound wave is traveling through the whole resonator, the shaping of my pharynx is dominating the tuning of that second formant to keep that pitch there, that auditory target. I can do that with an A vowel. Eh, eh, eh. That is the sort of blended under vowel color of the complementary color of an A vowel for a high note for a treble voice. I don't actually have to do that modification because my A resonance is on a high C and I don't sing that high very often. So I don't have to modify that one. But a treble mm. voice, if you're a treble voice and you sing above C5, you would begin to open that way for the A vowel. Same with the A. Uh, so. Uh, 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 that would be your modification for a high note or an A vowel in classical land. Now, if you're in CCM land and you want it to sound more speechy, try to find a way to, to uh, prioritize the over vowel, which is the color of the vowel that's in the word, more. By, but still trying to stay very relaxed in the neck. So let's take whatever. So I'll take the A vowel. I'm going to really A, A, A. 
but I'm still prioritizing that. That's going to be a brighter kind of an A. But I'm using that counterscore to whisper to 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 model it. The counterscore to whisper for the for the target of the A and comfort. This easy. If you do this whisper and you feel stressed afterwards, you are cheating towards the typical whisper. That one's going to dry and tire you. That one actually feels like a massage. That one feels good. I so by, by using this, this light, relaxed, chiaroscuro, optimal whisper, you're able to find and train these, these, uh, sorry? The shapes, shapes. The, shape, the shapes of the vowels as, as you're going higher. And so you then find actually what the vowel modifies to naturally yep. to create the illusion of it being the right vowel. Right. Right. And another benefit of the counterscore to whisper is it's a very, to do it, for example, if I'm doing an, uh, an E, if say I do an E of my range, uh, I can use affect. You know, that sort of warm pathos. I'm using a steady airflow. Or if I'm doing a song, whatever the song would be. Um, I don't know what, you know, in my land, I'd choose a classical song that I know. Uh, rehearsing the steadiness of that airflow is going to align with the steady flow that I want when I actually sing it so that I don't do wall 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 <laughs> wall I get a manina. so I, I can rehearse affect I can rehearse flow I can rehearse timbre I can rehearse everything but the actually phonated pitches I can imagine those and audiate them while I do it I could think I can imagine that part, even though I'm not doing it. And as I go higher, I'm going to imagine more of the ah, oh, because I know it's going to migrate there. La, la, as opposed to the la, shiri, la, shiri, skaldar. I've actually been in rehearsals, you know, I've done a lot of stage shows and opera musical, and, and especially in the opera where, you know, you're singing basically all day long in rehearsals. A, a lot of uh, professional colleagues um, would mark so this in, in this manner or similarly. And I had one colleague, he would he would mark, he marked, I think, like five weeks of the rehearsal. And I, I was really wondering, can this guy even sing? <laughs> and then he at the end, you know, when we finally got on stage, he was singing. It was it was brilliant. So there's a lot of a lot of great things you can do um, with this. Thanks for explaining how how singers can apply that. I've got a question from Doug Gardner for you. He says, uh, thank you. Um, how many registers do you count? So this is another interesting question, and I have something else to suggest that I already suggested that it's a little controversial. And again, I, I would say at this point, it's my opinion. <clears throat> what can the voice source supply? If we're talking about laryngeal registers, all right? They're laryngeal registers and they're acoustic registers and they interact with each other. The larynx supplies a source signal that has a set of harmonics and it has a certain spectral slope. What the voice source cannot do by itself before the resonator is involved is it can't choose, pick and choose which harmonics to feature. It can just give you a set of harmonics that weakens at a certain slope. What you can do is you can make that slope shallower or steeper. You can make it chestier or you can make it headier. You can make it more pressed or you can make it flutier, right? But if you've worked out the range and, and, and the goal of many training systems is to not have an unintended binary flip in the range. You know, classical certainly does this and many genres do. Sometimes we deliberately exploit that flip for an interpretive, you know, a legitimate interpretive thing. Perfectly fine, right? 
but uh, not so often in classical, but sometimes, but more often in some other genres, you'll deliberately flip over it back and forth as a, as a cool, you know, expressive thing. But if you train the larynx to, to smoothly negotiate range, all it's doing is very slowly changing the spectral slope of the set of harmonics that you're producing per pitch. Lower ones will have a shallower spectral slope with a buzzier sound. And the higher you go, it'll very smoothly steepen the spectral slope. So it gets a little warmer and less rough the higher you go. It gets smoother the higher you go. So if I do a, <clears throat> uh, I'll do toddler complaint. I got from Wolfgang's house also. Toddler complaint is that sound toddlers make when they don't get their way. When it's low, it's really buzzy and rich. When it's high, they're trying to make you feel sorry for them. So it goes like this. Since I went all the way up and down, I had a smooth laryngeal registration. I didn't have a sudden binary shift, but I had a very smoothed one. That means there were no audible laryngeal register changes. The larynx was hugely important. Obviously, without what the larynx is doing, there is no voice. This is not at all reducing the importance of the larynx. It's the sine qua non, if you know your Latin, the without which not. <laughs> okay, without what it's doing, there is no voice. Okay, so the larynx is hugely important. It's just not responsible for the color shifts that we've assigned to it all these centuries. It's responsible for the clear color shift when you flip from chest to falsetto or chest to pure head. That binary shift is so sudden, we will hear that go from bright to smooth, bright to smooth. But if you've smoothed that out like I just did, it no longer is creating audible timbral shifts that you would identify, aha, you just changed registers. The acoustic relationships of harmonics to the fundamental frequency always create timbral shifts. They can be subtle, but they're there. And you hear each one of those. So for me, it's uh, now, and you could talk about whistle and fry as extremes, and those are different laryngeal things a little bit. Well, fry is definitely different laryngeal. Whistle, we're still sorting. You know, people have various opinions about that. It could be purely an acoustic register, or it could be a little bit laryngeal and a little bit acoustic. Uh, chest to head is clearly a laryngeal register shift. If you smooth it out, we don't hear it, so we don't hear it as a, so a lot of people, you say, well, there's just one register when you do it right, you know, because you smooth it out, but you still hear these timbral transitions. When I had that soprano go into whoop timbre, probably you all heard that all of a sudden, that full, you know, so-called so operatic head tone pop in on those high notes. She wasn't changing a thing but the pitch. That was all of a sudden her fundamental frequency matched her first resonance, and then she tracked that higher. That was an acoustic register. It was not a laryngeal register. But you heard it as a terrible change, so you heard it as a vocal register. As an yeah. acoustic vocal register. Now, when she switched to chest voice lower, that was both laryngeal and acoustic. You heard her, you know, because she was still working out how to do that smoothly. The more smoothly she would do that, it would become primarily an acoustic register change if she had smoothed her laryngeal thing completely out, which you can do with enough training. Um, yeah, I think that's very fascinating and very Im Im <clears throat> important also to, so when you just said it's a purely acoustical shift, right? Mm -hmm. So, so physically, there's where you she's maintaining this student was maintaining pretty much the exact same configuration right. just allowing the 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 voice to move through there and the acoustics of it create the sound shift they're changing pitch which means the fundamental that they're singing and the set of harmonics is moving up but since they're not changing shape the resonance is staying put so those harmonics move through that resonance if i did it this way right. The harmonic move through the resonance, it gets stronger and then it get weaker as it got on the other side. And as they move stronger and weaker through that resonance, we hear that and we hear that as a shift. And the big ones that we really hear when the second harmonic moves through, they'll go from open timbre to closed timbre. And when the first one moves into it, that's whoop timbre. These other ones are there 
and you could call those register changes, but they're subtler so that we don't typically, uh, and they're getting closer to speech level timbre, so we don't notice them as much, which is why we don't really notice an E vowel going into closed timbre nearly as much as when we notice an A vowel goes into closed timbre. That one we really hear. Uh, so e, 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 if I hadn't pointed that out to you, you might not have paid any attention to that. <laughs> A lot of people, if they don't let it go into closed timbre, it would do this. E, it's rolling over. E, yeah. e, I'm not letting it. E, I have to allow some of that under vowel color. If I insist on only the E color, E, I avoid it closing. Yeah, it takes a while, doesn't it, to to accept for your conscious mind that that still sounds like an E to your listener, right? It does take a while for that. We've got a, another question from Horatio. He's a, Horatio writes, please correct me if I'm wrong with this conclusion. The deeper a voice is, bass, bass, baritone, the more limitations there are to singing frequency range of vowels in closed timbre, question mark? Well, um, basically, closed timbre will exist whenever you are singing less than an octave below the first resonance of the vowel that you're singing. So lower voices singing ranges for, well, th this is a great question, or right? a great question, uh, folks. The, the first resonances of, of all vowels for all voices typically sit in contact with the treble clef. The first resonances of higher voices sit slightly higher, the, of the lower voices sit lower. A typical bass is about D to D, and a typical soprano is about F F, F sharp to F sharp. Most of us are, bet are between about an E flat and an F, like E flat to E flat or F to F. They're, they're about an octave apart from, the, from your E to your A, ah, and they just move a little bit. Our ranges move a lot. So a bass range is, you know, a, a couple octaves lower than some other high voice ranges. So where your range is relative to your resonances will determine how much you sing in what kind of acoustic register. So you're absolutely right. A bass range is rather lower relative to where their close timbre sits. Similarly, a soprano's range is such that she probably never sings an E vowel in open timbre because she would have to sing an octave lower than her first resonance of her E vowel. And her first resonance of her E vowel is the bottom of the treble clef. So she's got to sing below F3 probably to get into open timbre on an E vowel. Some sopranos can do that. My wife's got a good chest extension, but some don't go that low, right? Yeah. And so, but but a soprano would sing an A vowel in open timbre. It's so she sings below the treble clef. She's in open timbre. You know, that's why that's why it's so easy to go into chest voice on an A vowel higher than say on an U vowel. An U vowel doesn't want to go into chest voice that high because its resonance is easier to go into chest voice in open timbre. Yeah. That's yeah, I, I also find that uh, uh, a lot of classically trained sopranos that want to get some more sound right. in the bottom of their register, they're not aware of exactly this point. They can open the vowel more and it'll help get uh, a brassy or timbre. They have to invite in more roughness. But the cool thing is, in order to get good roughness, I mean buzz, which helps your voice cut because it means high harmonics, you can do that in, in a head voice adjustment, a head voice laryngeal adjustment. You just have to learn how to get better chord closure as you're approaching that area. In the wild, head voice tends to, the, the closure strength of head voice tends to weaken near the bottom, which is why falsetto goes breathy on us until we learn how to close it into a good countertenor sound. It's breathy but you can learn to close it using things like pharyngeal voice, which is a, another strategy uh, that, that gives you in a mode two narrow, uh, thin fold setup with good chord closure. It's that really, you know, 
Mm, very high tongue posture, very buzzy, thin vocal flow, a good chord closure. So you can invite roughness. It'll give you buzz and cut, and it'll blend in the chest voice better on the way down after you vocalize in that for a while. Your chords tend to remember how to close better. And then you can migrate through there without just taking chest higher than you want to. Yeah, I love that you just said your 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 chords tend to remember how to close better. Because I, I really am a big believer that your current singing ability is your singing habit. Yep. And there's a lot of muscle memory and and really what we need to do if we want to improve anything is we've got to create a better habit. And then the voice does remember and it becomes a new normal, right? Somebody asked about falsetto or pure head. In the in the singing historical singing teacher world, falsetto was usually used to talk about that that adjustment in male or male sex, head voice. And it has tends to have weak closure until you learn how to close well, then we can create a good strong countertenor out of it. And we use the term head voice for that register in female. There's a lot of overlap between those two. So some people use the word falsetto for breathy mode two and head voice for pure cleaned up mode two. So this is a semantic problem. Uh, and as long as we know what we're talking about when we're communicating with each other, I don't I don't have a, a vested interest in one or the other way of talking about it. Uh, thin vocal fold where it's mostly a vocal ligament vibration with good closure is a good head voice or a good counter tenor falsetto or head voice, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and, and some voice scientists call that falsetto. It's, it's a historic term that has some unfortunate baggage, but it's basically that mode two ligament vibration rather than bulk of the vocal folds, which is a, a chestier thing. Yeah, thanks for that clarification mm -hmm. for Daniel. And it's a very good question too. And, and I get asked the same question often. It's really, that one's more of an issue of, of vocabulary, people using different words for for the same thing, but that was a great explanation of exactly what is actually happening. And that's what I also believe uh, we, we need to learn. Got a question from Max Hit uh, Studios. That's just the name in the chat. So can we, it's a good question. Can we differentiate a, a F2, H3 coupling in mode one versus in mode two on a spectrogram on a B4 for a male, for example, or does that look exactly the same? How, how could you differentiate? When he's uh, F2H, okay, second form and third harmonic coupling, got it, in a mode one versus a mode two on a spectrogram. For, okay, that's a good question. So basically, the, the question has to do with this. <clears throat> uh, the upper range of classical male singers, but also this is used in belt and this is used in some female singers to strengthen. Basically, we're talking about the pitches, the bottom half of the treble clef. That's what we're talking about. The bottom half of the treble clef, if you're in mode two head voice, that is a weak part of the range, no matter what you are, until you learn how to get good closure. One of the ways of getting that is to use your to get strength there is to use your second resonance which is higher on a higher harmonic like the third harmonic uh to, to strengthen that part of your range since uh, so that you let go of the uh yell coupling on the second harmonic on the first resonance it's kind of complicated but at any rate um can you differentiate i'll give you i'll tell you this the singer probably can feel the difference but I'm not so sure about the listener. Here's a, here's a, uh, if you know uh, the tenor uh, from last century, Richard Tucker, he was a, a, a Jewish cantor tenor, fabulous operatic tenor, a very ringing stentorian top, right in that range we're talking about, the bottom half of the treble clef, which is the tenor upper voice, okay? Really a, a marvelously ringy top. He swore he was singing in falsetto in some interview. And when I heard that, I said, what? So to him, he was in an arrangement that felt so easy at the glottis that he thought it felt like falsetto or a, or a mode two. Nobody in the hall thought he was singing in falsetto, I guarantee you. <laughs> so 
it, I think we can acoustically, I do know that acoustic registers mimic laryngeal registers. And with the right arrangement, we can create a sound that that make us may make us decide, well, I don't really care which laryngeal register is in as long as it feels good, if I'm getting the sound I want. Um, and I kind of lean in that direction. But as a teacher, I want to make sure that the basically the transglottal pressure difference stays comfortable. If the transglottal pressure difference, which is the breath pressure below the glottis versus the pressure, breath pressure above the glottis, if we can keep those close enough together so that the difference between them isn't too great, it will not hurt my voice. I can sing all night long and it'll feel very comfortable. If that difference is too great, the glottal resistance in order to create a good sound has to increase to bear the load of that difference. The greater that difference, the more resistance I have to offer, which means my chords are going to smack together increasingly harder, and eventually that's going to create tissue damage or tiredness. And how do we do that? It turns out we can raise the supraglottal pressure with acoustic strategies. Fascinating. Convergence, some convergence in the system that creates enough back pressure above the glottis to keep it high enough to keep the difference between the two. You can do that with anything. You can do that with the distortions, in which case it's not necessarily transglottal pressure differences, trans vibrator pressure differences, whatever the heck you're vibrating in there. If you can keep the pressure below and above at a safe enough uh, interval, you won't, you won't hurt the tissues that you're colliding. Yeah, it's yeah. fast. I, I can speak to that because I've experienced that both of those things. So one I noticed um, I was singing. Oh, now I'm, now I'm not, not going to do you do you know the the, the opera, the Postillon de Longement? Yep. There was a the tenor who sings these D's again and again. Well, it was it was interchangeable for me if I sang it in, you know, M1 or M2 or chest or head. And I actually ended up choosing just to sing it in in what felt like falsetto because in the hall it sounded exactly the same but it was a lot less work right. and also um speaking to the the point that you just talked about vocal distortion if you i've experienced that too if you've the high and some higher pitches with distortion it's actually more relaxed to sing that pitch because right. of that intermittent right you know, you can, I, I don't teach that, I, so I'm certainly not the specialist to ask about just <laughs> what I played around with. Uh, well, basically, I use that sound when I'm having computer troubles. <laughs> when I reach my frustration limit. I do. I go into my, uh, 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 you know, my false vocal fold or whatever else I'm vibrating down there. And as long as I, you know, have a comfortable level of vibration, it's no problem. But it's a trans vibrator pressure difference is staying comfortable. Yeah, it's fascinating. It just like releases pressure somehow if if you're in the if you got the good balance, right? <laughs> I've got a, got another question from Doug. I don't know. I'm not it's, this question reads are church organ registers also measured by the perceived frequencies or the mechanical cause of the sound? Thank you. I, I, I don't know much about church organs, but Right. So I would assume that organ pipes are single, like they're single resonators that have one dominant frequency. The low, their, their lowest frequency would be their dominant frequency. So they have to have a different length pipe for each frequency. They can't have one pipe do all of the frequencies, which you do with other instruments where you change the length of the pipe by finger holes or, you know, holes in the thing. We have one tube that we can reshape to retune our our resonances that we feature. So it's probably a little bit different in that regard. Again, not my specialty, but that's that's my simplistic understanding of that. Yeah. I love I love that description because I say that all the time, you know, we don't have a fixed shape instrument. You know, if the more if we're wanting to create a very constant sound, then we want to keep the shape of the instrument as consistent as possible. But we can we can jump from tuba to trumpet in an instant, right? So here's my my silly model. If my thing will allow us to show it, my my, my um, 
vibrator creates a buzz of harmonics. There's actually a little bit of a resonator right there because the vibrator is inside this tube. So it even has a little bit of color there. Our laryngeal buzz is just a buzzy thing of harmonics. Put it in the resonator, which is the tube. I'll do it in front of me. That way it stays in the picture. This is a perfectly uniform tube. We don't have a perfectly uniform tube, as you know. But if I narrow the tube there, that's going to be an e-vowel because it's more like a narrowing near the front of my mouth with an open throat. And an a-vowel, counterintuitively, is a narrowing in the pharynx where the tongue has backed into the pharynx a little bit and the mouth is more open. So if I put that same set of harmonics in this tube and do this, you'll hear those two vowels. You know, I could do an E A R. We're just reshaping the tube. And what is that doing? It's moving those resonances around and choosing different harmonics that have different spectral tone colors. E A I, you know, the higher one. And the lower one is going, whoa. But we tend to hear it blended. So we hear those other colors. Yeah, that's super. Imp <laughs> I think that is so uh, important to understand. Also, but we get a little bit over over passionate about creating the perfect E vowel, right? Where whereas we're not going to necessarily because of the way we hear. If I'm constantly and I did this for a long time, going for that perfect E E E E, and it it took everything front. And just like you said, you mentioned the, this pharyngeal tuning, yep. and that's the best spot in the world to do an E. Yep. Nothing ever gets tight, but nobody told me that, you know, for 20 years. <laughs> you sing Maria, right? I've seen that. Yeah. Just as an example, so my, my, my A vowel, my A resonance is higher than I sing, so I actually don't have to modify it. I don't, when I say I don't have to actively modify it, I don't have to change the shape. I'm going to hear a lot of ah uh in my high ah. Uh. But my E, if I sing Marie, I'm going to die. I have to sing Marie. Marie, Marie. So my E has to be more open than my ah. Maria, Maria. I'm just doing it in falsetto, but in full voice, it'd be the same thing. Maria, Maria. Back away from my mic a little bit. <laughs> Maria, re, re, would die. Re, yeah. re, e, e, e. It's that sound. I, you know, I showed you how I tuned that e. Air angel. E, e. That's the one that's going to work for that high E vowel. Yeah, and it sounds, I mean, to the listener, it sounds like a perfect E. Like e. Yeah, I, one of my uh, Australian coaches, he was a, you know, a wonderful lyric tenor on stage across Europe for about 40 years. But he, he would just, he would just open his mouth and just do E, A, E, and he's, it's all in the same place, Philippe. It's all in the same place. <laughs> you know, with a whisper. For example, open your mouth wide open, uh, and if, as long as you know what pitch is tune for it. So if I do my E A A R E A A R E A A R E A A R E A A R E A A R, as long as I know what pitches go with those vowel colors, and as long as I keep my my neck relaxed, feeling comfortable, so I want it to feel soothing. Yeah. Then that E is going to sound like E to me. Well, I know we have um, we have one one singer, Erickson, uh, who does like to sing classical music. So I'll I'll give him a couple minutes and see if he wants to jump in. I know he's he's he would love to work with you. It's okay. it's just he's a little bit shy because he's always volunteering. <laughs> But I know it'll really help him because he does, uh, you can find something Ericsson um, classical if you want to and, and do some quick straw phonation or whatever you need to do to get yourself warmed up. We have another question from Florence Worley. Um, she's asking, so are you saying that the constrictors, the pharyngeal constrictors, maneuvering the vowel formants 
that's how I'm understanding that question. Actually, um, I would say they, they can, they certainly can. Obviously, if you use the pharyngeal constrictors, uh, people do that for pharyngeal voice, for example. They actually narrow the pharynx to sort of hug the epilarynx. In a classical singer, we have the epilarynx and then we have the, the laryngopharynx around it. And there are these piriform sinuses, the spaces around the epilarynx, which creates, helps to create a, a, a depth of tube that helps us to have a, a, a low first formant along with opening the mouth. Um, but in, in uh, certain genres, they want to just, a, they don't want a caudal scooter sound. I would say they want a caudal caudal sound. They want a bright, bright sound. They will narrow the, the pharynx and sort of hug the epilarynx with the pharyngeal walls, which eliminates the piriform sinuses, which eliminates the depth of the sound. And you get very bright and you get harmonics all the way up. The, uh, the piriform sinuses create an anti-resonance actually that, that kill harmonics just above about 4,000 to 6,000. So there's a dead space with the piriform sinuses there. When you, when you close the pharynx, that dead space goes away and you get harmonics all the way up. So you get that really witchy, bright pharyngeal voice thing that we use to, to train chord closure and head voice. But in classical, what you're doing to, to shape the, the, that narrowing in the pharynx is, is the tongue. is almost all tongue movement, not pharyngeal constriction, just changing the tongue shape. Yeah, and it feels like right behind the tongue, you know, the tongue is large, <laughs> but I always point about this area, that area in there, that tube is, is quite stable in its opening most of the time, isn't it? Yeah. What I try to avoid in every genre, unless somebody can show me a genre for which this is useful, I haven't found one yet, is the, the uh, yawn sensation. And I know this is a very popular <clears throat> um, device some teachers have used to get the palate up and the larynx down, but it pulls the tongue down and back and it dulls the timbre. <clears throat> so I don't want any of that sensation in, I don't want it in my classical. I'd rather have ringy in the back. Yeah, yeah, yay, yay, that yay, yay, that to me is a little false and fakey. And it kills ring, even though it adds depth. It's a kind of a, and it's hard work. Uh, so, so I don't do that. Uh, that's, uh, and, and that feels like pharyngeal distension. And it's possible that there's a little bit of distension somewhere, but it's mostly a backing of the tongue into the pharynx uh, too far. Instead of yai, 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 is enough to create an awe that way without my pulling it down and further back with the yawn. <clears throat> so w by the way, when you do the yawn, it feels like you're moving the back wall further back. I recommend keeping the back, the sensation, that's a lie, by the way, you got a spine back there, it can't move further back. Uh, there's a little bit of distortion possible below there, but I don't go there. I recommend keeping the pharyngeal wall, the sensation of the pharyngeal wall, where it actually is in front of your ears. So keep the sensation of distance from front to back comfortably short. Yah, yah, yay. And so, yay, 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 yay. If you do that, you will have fronted the tongue enough to give you a, a ringy sound <clears throat> uh, without distorting the sound towards a dulled yawn or swallowed sound. Thank you. Thank you for that. I also use a, sometimes we'll use a yawn as a stretch, but exactly as you said, if it goes, if you, if you're doing any kind of a vocalese descending to, you know, open space, the very first thing I say is you, you cannot swallow the tongue. Right. You've, it's got to, you got to maybe ride through that space for, but you got to keep the tongue moving forwards. Otherwise, hey, just end up like that. Um, Doug has a, 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 another question for us. So the question is, so a register is subjective, question mark, depending on the person who perceives the sound, question mark. So the word is not scientific. Well, register does not mean anything mechanical like an, an organ. I mean, we, did we discuss this a little bit, so maybe I'm just late and we've already uh, answered this question. No, no. So registers are defined with two main characteristics. It is a stretch of range that is homogeneous in timbre. That's a perceptual characteristic. Yes. Because timbre is evaluated by perception. 
created by the same mechanical principle. There's the physical piece. Forever we assumed that if you change the mechanics of the larynx, that would change the mechanics of the, the, the timbral components of the output. And timbre is primarily made out of the relative uh, strength of the harmonics of the sound. You have the set of harmonics per pitch and, and timbre is made out of the blend of the relative intensities of those harmonics. As I explained earlier, the voice source can just give you a slope of them, and then the resonator can pick and choose among them. So as long as timbre <clears throat> uh, remains part of the definition of a vocal register, which it in, inextricably is, I mean, otherwise, what are we talking about? You know? Yeah. Change a mechanical, if you change a mechanical principle and it doesn't change the timbre, who cares? You know, you didn't notice. So. I, this is why I maintain that acoustic registers fit the classic definition of registers, which goes all the way back to well, Seashore at least. It's a range segment of similar color created by the same mechanism that is distinct from another range segment of a different color created by a different mechanism. We assumed it was a different laryngeal mechanism. Uh, I'm telling you, that mechanism is acoustic relationship. This is one mechanism. That's another mechanism. This is one mechanism. This is open timbre. That's another mechanism. That's another mechanism. It's a, and the acoustic registers are very cleanly, in fact, mathematically definable. They are cleaner and clearer than the laryngeal registers, which we continue to argue about. Well, is it is it sixty percent TA or sixty percent CT? <laughs> How do we do that? And you know, I mean, and I'm not. I mean, this is not an argument against the importance of the larynx. As I said, nothing happens without that. Okay, <laughs> as our raw material, you know, it's just that the timbral shifts we hear unless you are deliberately really changing the larynx. I, one other thing I didn't mention, which is true for all the other genres. The larynx is supplying, supplying a set of harmonics and a spectral slope. It's also supplying the relative cleanness of the signal. You can make a dirtier signal with some non-harmonic frequency content that creates noise, or you can create a clean signal, which is essentially all harmonic frequencies. And a lot of genres use, use that other kind of signal very expressively and successfully, right? But other than that, if you're if you're we're talking about a clean signal, number one and two, if we're talking about a clean signal that has been, then you figure out how to do it smoothly across range without a sudden binary shift. If you've done that, all of a sudden, any timbral shifts you're hearing across range are acoustic in origin, and the and the mechanism is quite mechanical and physical and measurable and predictable. It's more predictable than any other kind of register change as long as you know where your first resonance is and what pitch you're singing, because the intervals of the harmonic series are fixed. Octave, octave and a fifth, two octaves. You can predict it completely. Yeah, and that's and it, scientific, but the perception piece, how you hear the shift, uh, is that science? Well, there are scientific studies on perception, but it's, it's a trickier science. <laughs> Right. But the more predictable it is, the more reliable it is as a targeting strategy. Um, would you like to work with Erickson? Let Erickson take yourself off of mute. And because I think it's it's we've had a nice, very uh, detailed, educated discussion. But all of that, you know, does the singer. What do you do with it? Yeah, exactly. So let's let's get some practical on hands. <laughs> I'm going to put Erickson on here. I'm going to add you into a spotlight. I'm going to take myself off and let you guys have some singing fun. All right. So uh, what is your voice type? Tenor. Tenor. All right. Um, so do me this. Sing me an O vowel on this pattern. Close O, like German O. Oh, oh. Is that it? Oh, 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 o
quite acoustic register is the yeah, an open closer whatever do it from here So that top note on that third one turned over. He was staying at open timbre higher than he needs to on all of those. That was a D. Not bad, though, at all. Good sound, good clean sound. I'm going to encourage you to let that one turn over. And what it's going to do, you, you're holding, oh, think of the O. Oh, uh, think of it. Do this for me. Say, oh, oh, oh. Can you do that? Oh, 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 there you go. Oh, oh, oh. You feel it migrate a little bit towards mm -hmm. them. Do that again. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, excellent. Now that migrated the way I want your singing voice to migrate. Okay. And it felt okay, right? Yeah. Now here's what I want you to do on these three pitches. We're going to use expression. I want you to think, oh, oh, oh. First of all, I'll do what I just did, random pitches, but a new expressive thought to make each of those increments. Okay. Oh. oh, again, oh. oh, oh, there you go, oh, again, oh, I want you to think that way to change each pitch, try that. Here's what happened. The second one did well. You went, oh, oh. it went open on the third one. Okay. Oh, 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 oh. Do the speech thing again. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Yes. Okay. That's the feeling and the timbre you want on the top note. in that direction all right that will get easier and smoother as you play with it so that you don't feel like you have to do it as much you just let it mm -hmm. but our instinct is to hold on to that open timbered o from speech oh oh right good now do this same thing can you do that oh so we can first do this Oh, 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 can you do that in speech? Oh, 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 you're still doing a little bit of oh, oh, right. oh, 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 right, and it'll feel a little bit like you're sort of collecting that sound and bringing it inside instead mm -hmm. of broadcasting it out. Oh. Oh, do that for me. Oh, yes, that one migrated further. Was it comfortable enough? Did it feel okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it just feels like, really, you want me to darken it that much? Really, you want me to let it go there? You know, you got to get used to that. You know, oh, 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 oh. What you actually did, in spite of the sensation, was you kept the shape the same. Mm -hmm. When it, when the timbre opens. You're either opening the front or you're subtly narrowing and, and raising the bottom of the tubing. Mm. Oh, so if you think, of, oh, 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 do anything you can to distract yourself from the vowel, chasing the vowel and just let the inflection go up. Do that one more time. Oh, oh. Yeah. Right, so we're going to do this and then. You're gonna think, oh, 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 right? Here we go. Oh, 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 oh. Right there. Then they do this one right back. Oh, 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 oh. All right, so, so just for everybody, when you first play with this, or some of them first exploring this, there's a strong tendency to reshape the tubing towards the under vowel color. Oh, he wants me to migrate this towards an ooh. Oh, 
and I just reshaped instead of oh I went oh oh I actually reshaped a little bit to make it happen this is a process that you have to go through and it's an exploratory process and again the more you can distract yourself and just let the affect take over which you can almost always get to happen in the speech loops before you can get it to happen in the song tuned pitches because that you know our musical training it it's probably a little bit of a different part of the brain that's helping to even motivate the pitch uh, uh, targets is causing us to do something a little bit differently uh, generally you want to take any vowel you've got and figure out some affective uh, strategy that will allow you to let it migrate through all of its colors with a comfortable neck, whatever it is. Let's take, ah, um, ah, oh, okay, ah, oh, kind of, oh yeah, ah, oh, can you do that? Ah, ah, ah. That was a better migration. How did that feel to you? Talk to us about it. It it all feels natural when I'm speaking it, and then when I sing it, after I analyze, I'm like, I know I moved something, and I can't always tell what I moved. Right. So it's an exploratory process that you just have to. But but the uh, the speech loop once you find how to let it migrate is your teacher. That is the teacher of your kinesthesia. Is the teacher of your somato sense. Oh, what did that feel like well, how, when I did that? How, how, you know, how can I, how can I remember that sensation, the path, the migratory path of that sensation, and then you, you know, gradually coax yourself to do pitched patterns to allow that to happen. So in a sense, you don't do those, other than your brain's intention has to allow the timbre and somatosensory migrations to happen, rather than your brain saying, "I've got to make it." feel and sound like an ah in my speech level you know ah 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 if i can trick myself to a spontaneous inflective migration that's my teacher then whatever let's take up let's take a eh, eh. here's uh, do you know who the fonz is yeah the fonz? Eh, eh, eh. try that Hey, 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 right. He didn't go, eh, or hey, hey. You did it good. Well, do it again. Hey. Excellent. That was a very good migration for that vowel. And you left the shape the same. Could you tell that that vowel was migrating? No. <laughs> do it again. That's okay. That's fine. That's actually great. Do it again. Hey. So lower, eh, 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 eh. Yeah, I mean, I hope that the crowd can hear that migration because that's migrating just fine. And uh, it's not going, you're not chasing a yell, eh, eh, eh. eh. But in your healthy voice with clean chords, you're getting more ring, which you know healthy chords would get than mine would get. <clears throat> so we we we're okay with that. It sounds fine, it sounds normal. But we're hearing a little bit of an a a instead of an a a a. That was good. Do that for me. Do do this on the a vowel. A. It's migrating perfectly fine. You're leaving your tongue right away. Now do this for me. Let it vibrate. A right. A right. And by the way, to stimulate uh, vibrancy, without I don't want to hear your vibrato, but I want vibrancy in the tone. And if the rate is nice and the excursion is nice, we just hear the pitch. We don't hear the wiggle. Okay. The, but. Uh, the, uh, this is from Heidi Moss's work and others that that we know that limb gesture is related to um, f to voicing in the brain. So do this at, at this rate. Um, so you're just going to very gently clap three per pitch, and your brain is just simply going to refresh its thought of that a vowel. Eh. 
that the audience could hear how much how freer that was he let it have vibrato but we didn't hear vibrato we just heard a nice vibrancy i call that vibrant singleness of pitch where it is if we measured it with a spectrogram we would see undulation of the frequency but at that rate and that excursion our brain just hears nice pitches it doesn't hear flutter or wiggle or wobble it just hears a nice spinny pitch that was very nice yeah, Thank cool. You. <clears throat> Thank you. So there's nice job, Erickson and, and Ken. Thank you both yep. very much. I'm going to uh, let us please um, welcome, uh, welcome. Let us thank our co-host today, Mr. Kenneth Bosman, for a wonderfully educative live stream. So give him some virtual round of applause and a big shout out on YouTube and Facebook. It's been very educational, very fun. Ken, thank you so much for spending your Saturday morning with all of us. Welcome, I had fun. And I uh, hype the Kinesthetic Voice Pedagogy 2 uh, has a lot of this stuff in a little bit more detail. If you, if you're in, if you get interested in it, you wanna follow up on that. Yeah, follow up in the chat. I'll repost it for all of you, but um, Ken, can just release the second edition of his book where you can really get into all the details on this. And if you're interested, you can pick it up at this link I'm putting in the chat here as well. Thank you to everyone who participated and asked questions, wonderful questions today. Every question helps us all learn more. Have a wonderful Sunday as tomorrow, a wonderful rest of your Saturday. And if you're not already, please follow us on YouTube and Facebook. Click the subscribe button to stay informed about all of the upcoming live streams. Next, next week, we have uh, uh, Kaya Herset Carney coming on, and she is wonderful. We, if uh, you want to check out more about Ken Bozeman, just go to KenBozeman.com. And we look forward to your feedback. Reach out to me anytime at singingrevealed at gmail.com. Have a great, great weekend, everyone. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. I'm gonna play off our trailer for you one more time here. Have a great weekend. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week. Music is one of the most ubiquitous art forms in the world. Every day, millions of musicians around the globe dream of getting a coveted standing ovation. That starts with one's unique individuality and self-perseverance. An industry made up of some of the most iconic figures the world has ever known. He invites you on a journey to gain first-hand knowledge from one of the most prestigious, world-renowned vocal coaches in music entertainment. I've been performing and coaching internationally for over 30 years. I'm here to reveal the truth about singing to you. I believe this knowledge should be available to everybody everywhere. You deserve to know the truth about singing. What would somebody expect if they were to start maybe getting into singing for the first time? Of course, it all depends on what your end goal is. I've created Singing Reveal to give you the answers and solutions you're looking for to save you time, money, and years of frustration. I know that any singer of any ability level who uses this course will transform their understanding of singing and their vocal design, and they will improve dramatically. You may have health issues or injuries 
that prohibit you from being in this optimal body alignment. So don't feel constricted that you have to stand in a perfect position the entire time you're singing. Movement is allowed. Many of my professional colleagues and clients concentrate on different muscle groups. This is absolutely okay. They have found what works best for them. What's most important is what works for you. Thanks for everybody tuning in. Join our beta launch of my new online course. Be a pleasure to work with you. Part of the course is that I'm doing master classes every month, multiple master classes for people on the course and Singing Revealed members. Have a fantastic weekend. Thank you once again, Ken. Thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you next time on Voice Masters.